Taylor Swift actually had to deal with the Singapore government to actually perform exclusively there and mm. she was actually paid 13 million per show. Hey guys, this is Ken Ming here and this is Peter from Mr. Money TV. Welcome to the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about public policy in ways that are relevant to you, the man and the woman on the street and in the shopping mall. So, coffee, coffee time. Yes. Coffee time. Yeah. Okay. So firstly, we would like to thank our sponsor for this episode. Uh, once again, it is Zeus Coffee. Zeus Coffee, where coffee is a necessity, not, not a luxury. Not a luxury. Yeah, especially for people like us who needs to drink coffee every day. Yeah, this is very important. Now, in my hand is actually a CEO latte. Okay. Yeah, what about yours? Uh, I think it's also CEO latte. Yeah. Okay, let's take a sip. So... Actually, the other thing I like about Zeus, right, is their taglines, you know. I'm not sure whether you've seen this mm. on the app. Um, high quality beans, roasted to perfection. Okay, good ring to it. Okay. Second one is, uh, fix your caffeine crave. This one, like, fix your caffeine crave just one touch away. Oh. Because their app is excellent, right? And then the next one is, uh, last one, handcrafted coffee, hand delivered. <laughs> right, so I, I have to say that they are, they are very creative. Mm -hmm. They are very creative. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Almost as good as Nando's or not as good? What do you think? I think it's about there. About there, right? About there. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, if they were to just add a little bit of a local twist in a very sarcasm or make fun manner, mm, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yes. then that would add on to it. Mm. Yeah, but I'm not sure whether that's the corporate direction really. Okay, okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, Nando's very good, a bit edgy and all that, you know, mm. and, and I really like their product. I, I go there quite often, uh, especially when I... I uh, need to, uh, you know, have my grilled chicken. So, mm. although they're not a sponsor yet, you know, think about it, Nando's. <laughs> Next time we should be eating and... Uh, yeah, kind of so, yes. <laughs> I mean, we're quite edgy on this show, you know. Maybe you can incorporate <laughs> some of the themes, you know. So, yeah, that's our, that's our marketing pitch. Nah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, what have you been up to? I mean, today, we're actually recording early. Usually, we'll record on a Friday. Yep. Uh, but today is uh, Tuesday. We're recording a bit early because, uh, you know, yeah, there's going to be a company retreat. But how was mm. your weekend? My weekend has been great. Uh, managed to squeeze one round of golfing and okay. made me realize one thing because the other day I went and played golf. The guy who played with me is actually a Korean. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And guess what? He speaks fluent Malay. How long has he been here? He's been here for 12 years and he doesn't speak much English but he speaks very fluent Malay because he has been selling Korean beauty products in Malaysia. Oh, wow. Yeah. So okay. I asked him this question. So, kenapa you jual product ka Malaysia bukan ah, pergi Thailand ah, ke ah. Indonesia ah. then this is what he said Malaysia Korean beauty product sales mm, mm. is the highest in this region that oh, he has jalan seen. yang terbaik sekali di seluruh yes. Asia Tenggara okay, okay. and because his customer are mostly Malay mm. and he had to reply Malay mm. so he said that his Malay is very good because of that lah. Oh, so can you can you name the, the, the brand here you know I mean I'm not saying that they should be sponsors <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. beauty brand uh, uh, so yeah maybe we should consider investing in skincare since uh, you're skincare, appearing on screen yeah. more right <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so it's, a, it's called Slim Korea Slim Korea. Yeah, Slim Korea. You can okay. find them on a Shopee and I went and check it out. They're, they're actually pretty big. 188,000 followers on, oh, wow. okay, on okay. Shopee. Okay. Which, and he's been here for 12 years so obviously there's business to sustain mm. him here. It made me wonder about Malaysia's economy, right? Because uh, as a Korean coming here to Malaysia doing business for 12 years and it tells me the business is very good when it comes to Korean skincare product. Yep. And coincidentally, we recently just announced our GDP result. Mm. And you made quite some statement about it. Uh, I did, <laughs> and we'll talk about that in in terms of the the substantive segment right after this. But uh, before that, we need to go and talk about some of the uh, comments. Mm. So our episode dropped on Monday. Uh, as we speak here, there are about thirty one thousand views already, uh, and about thirty three thousand already. Oh, thirty three thousand. Just already. after oh. I checked, just now thirty three. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, and then also uh, how many comments? Uh, quite a lot of comments already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about hundred over comments. So let's. Let's have some comments. Um, the one that, that I want to address first of all is, uh, let's see, the one on Sarawak. Uh, you know, mm. we always think that, uh, you know, us here in Malaysia, or Malaya as they say, uh, always uh, meminggirkan orang kat Sarawak. We yeah. always go and uh, don't give them uh, enough attention. I want to read out this comment from uh, somebody who lives in Bintulu and talking about uh, Sarawak and the oil and gas economy there. Uh, this person, you know, talked about us looking down, us Malayans looking down on Sarawak and he said, mm. like you said, Sarawakian are looked down upon by West Malaysians. 
I was asked if I lived on a tree when I was studying at Taylor's in the late 80s. Uh, part of this fault lies with Sarawak government who, when featuring Sarawak in the media, will only show long houses, the jungles and the caves, you know, their natural mm. and some of their tourist attractions, not giving local chances to have higher education. We have many foreign institutions of higher learning, but not all families can afford the fees. Uh, we have local universities, but what is the percentage of Sarawakians studying there? Uh, to be fair, it is also the mindset of the locals who do not put much importance into education. I know many parents who do not push their children to even finish Form 5 at the very least. Hopefully, with the new initiatives by the current government, it will create many work opportunities for the locals and push young students to seek higher education to meet the demands for professionals. So right now, uh, I think I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you a story that I had personal experience on. Uh, when I was a member of parliament, one of the things that we did uh, under this Impian Sarawak project uh, that was initiated and started by Tony Pua uh, to uh, bring rural development projects to parts of uh, Sarawak that needed some assistance. You know, we did it on a very small scale. One of the places I went to was a place called Kampung Kiding in the Borneo Highlands. Uh, and I found a young boy there who was like maybe 14, 15 years old. Right. Uh, he was working the fields, he was helping the father and then he came and talked with us. Uh, and I asked him, hey, why, you know, why are you not studying in school? He said, tak suka. Uh, Kenapa? Dia uh, kata, tak suka lah, tak bosan lah kat sana. Lebih baik kat rumah. So then I asked the father, why you know, did the son not go to school? And because his village is uh, quite far away from the nearest secondary school, they have to live in hostels. And when they live in hostels in the larger cities, they get bullied. They don't have enough uh, money, they don't have resources, they, the clothes they wear may be a bit old. So the people in the, 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 the urban areas, they bully the kids from the rural areas. Right? And, and that means that you know, the kind of uh, uh, exposure they have to education is not a very positive one. And that's why many of them end up going back to the, the kampung, going back to their, their longhouses and all that to, mm. to, to work there at a very young age. True, yeah. true. Have you heard of similar things like that? Uh, yes, actually, uh, there was a period of time when I was in high school, I used to be very actively going to Orang Asli village to help them with some tuitions. Yeah? Uh, I still recall the time that some of them actually shared with us that yeah, similar kind of stories, they mm. couldn't adapt into the society, so therefore they choose to actually remain back in their kampongs and uh, do all sorts of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things I also realised when I visited the longhouses in Sarawak uh, and also some of the Orang Asli villages here in, in Peninsula is that uh, many of these longhouses and um, you know villages, there are very few books. I'm not sure whether you realize that or not. Mm. Uh, for the long houses, uh, usually they will have one book and the book is uh, the Bible. <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, that's true. That's yeah, I'm true. not sure how much of it is read, uh, but I think that also, you know, especially in this day and age where kids probably will start looking at their mobile phones before they start looking at books or, or you know, textbooks and things like that. I think that's also one of the challenges that, uh, you know, we face, uh, not just in Peninsula, but maybe exacerbated in Sabah and Sarawak where access to this kind of uh, reading material and the culture of uh, reading and learning may not be as uh, well developed as other places. Mm. Uh, you know, and it could be a big urban rural divide, it could be a divide between uh, West Malaysia and, and Sabah and Sarawak. So yeah, definitely appreciate uh, comments uh, of that yeah. nature. Uh, there's another comment that I want to read out and I want to get your reaction to this. Uh. Uh, this is by Henry Basil 54. It does not mean that if DAP is in a coalition, it must make sacrifices and compromise its founding principles and values. What DAP always wanted was a one Malaysia. Wow, this one sounds like Najib a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I strongly believe that DAP is losing its importance of being the only party that wants a level playing field, knowing that the country without a level playing field will soon be behind China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia. I can guarantee this that this will happen by 2030. I think... We're already behind some of these countries <laughs> like uh, Korea, Japan and Singapore. But yeah, we get the point. Uh, what, what do you think? Do you think you know, that DAP should uh, speak up more or to try to uh, advocate more for its principles of wanting a level playing field? I think uh, that shouldn't be something that's always spoken out. Yeah, personally, uh, I mean, just to be sensitive to the narrative, right? Mm. Uh, I think the first thing is that talk about more important topics like how to actually increase the income level of mm. people in general first. Mm. I think when people are well-fed, uh, they feel that their demands are met, 
they are ambitious are not being ambitions are not being hindered mm. by policies mm. then only you talk about a uh, level playing field sure. yeah mm. i think that should be a more proper way of doing it and cause less instability lah yeah and you know we just pointed out one area uh, you know our friend from bitulu pointed out one area uh, you know where uh, there is uh, an uneven playing field you know the, the yes. uneven playing field between totally let's say agree. Uh, you know the people in the rural areas. Uh, you know the the natives of Sabah and Sarawak in the long houses versus the urban areas, right? So yeah. all those are issues that uh, you know we we should place some importance on. And if let's say we advocate for issues such as more equality in uh, education access, right? I think those are things that a lot of people can support. Yeah. Uh, you know across all races, when we talk about one thing to uh, make sure that we have uh, good public transportation in the Uh, develop and maybe less developed areas, even in the, in, in the urban areas, uh, you know that's something that I think many people mm. can can support lah. So I think having those kind of broad based approach to policy making, I think would be a better approach than to harp on certain hot but hot button issues that maybe you know will not really improve the country significantly. Yeah, because I think that that's um something that we really need to take a look at, right? Because when you talk about Bumi Putra as a whole. Right, there's a uh, Orang Asli being involved. There's a uh, uh, people on Sabah Sarawak being involved, mm. and the truth is, I I like the concept of when they talk about fairness, mm. uh, especially in Islam when they talk about fairness. Right, they said fairness sometimes is not about uh, being everyone gets the equal stuff, but how do you adjust <coughs> so that you know you get what you need in that sense, right? Yeah. So so in yeah. economics there, or rather in you know philosophy, there's a concept called. Um, <laughs> Equality of opportunity versus equality of outcomes. Mm. So I think mm. what people are asking for is a equality of opportunity rather than equality of outcomes. Yeah. Like, right. People having the same access to to the same kind of opportunities. Yeah. It's impossible in any country to have that. But I think we should move closer to that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And speaking on about you know income and improving you know the livelihood of people, uh, you know the GDP figures came out uh, for fourth quarter of 2023 and also by extension uh, the full year gdp growth rate so you know it was announced last friday by bank negara and the fourth quarter gdp increase was about 3% the overall increase in gdp for the year of 2023 was 3.7% uh, which was a little bit lower than the projected figure of between 4 to 4.5% right so you know there has been some discussion about this uh, i think the government feeling a little bit defensive because People are saying you didn't reach your target, <laughs> uh, and I came out with a statement today to say that actually, if you talk about the man on the street, which is you guys, doesn't matter whether it's three point seven or four percent, right? I don't really think That's you can true. tell the difference, right? That's true. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's, so yeah, so it's just like when they announce inflation figure, when they say it's three percent, very good. Mm. But when I walk to the mama opposite, uh, the the inflation is a little bit different, lah. Huh? Sure. Yeah, that's not what I truly feel, lah. Uh. Yeah. Sure. So, so I I think you know after after reading the responses, you know, from different sides about the GDP figures, I released a press statement today uh, to talk about uh, five areas in which the government can do maybe more practical things to improve the livelihood of people. Uh. Mm. Uh, but before I go into the five points, I also said that look, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the average man on the street. Yep. And understand the kind of. Uh, Pressure points that they have been facing over the uh, past, I would say, three years since 2022 in terms of the reopening of the economy uh, post COVID. Uh, and I'm 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 just going to go through these points. I'm not sure. You know, I also want to get your response to see how mm. you you resonate to them. Yep. Uh, right. So one one difference, and all these points point point towards uh, the rakyat actually feeling a bit more of the pinch, That's uh, right. which is why they don't really care about the GDP growth. They care about how. Uh, you know the the economy affects them individually. So one thing, after 2022, there wasn't uh, the the loan moratorium stopped, mm-hmm. right? Loan moratorium stopped end of 2021. You had to start repaying back your loans, your housing loans, your car loans, right? So this is one big area of disposable income that has been taken w- taken away from you, right? Uh, the other area where you would feel the income being less would be a lot of the COVID related uh, help assistance uh, from the government stopped. That's two, and then the third thing would be you, the you know you can't take out any more EPF money lah. Yeah. <laughs> right. The last I think withdrawal was uh, in uh, 2022, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Uh, a lot of political pr- pressure on that. Uh, you know, uh, took 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 a few times already. So 
you know, because of this, then you feel that suddenly, hey, you know, my disposable income is less already. Uh, did you get a sense of that, you know, talking to different people or moving around? Yes, yeah. Uh, I think for most of the people, because our channel mainly caters to the public, right, and normal consumers. Mm. And what we can see when it comes to the sentiment of the people in the street, generally, it's just like what you think, right? GDP doesn't really matter. Mm. I, I don't even understand how it works. <laughs> right for most people yeah, uh, that right? one you have to come yeah. and take a PPE program <laughs> take economics from yes. tailors then yeah. we can explain more to you about how GDP is calculated so but, yeah. most people don't even understand how it works mm. but what they really feel is actually when they go out and eat in a mamak store or mm. either when they order a cup of coffee or whatever they do paying for fees you know they can feel the pinch and that's what matters mm. and it seems like just like what you say in your article which I totally agree one point there right which is that the government should stop hiding behind uh, all the past issues like blaming mm. 1MDB, this and that, and come up with a lot of different kind of excuses. Mm. But just face it head on yeah, yeah. and address the issues and tell people what they can expect moving ahead. I think that would give much more assurance to the public. Lah. Yeah, so I mean, another, another example you know, in that vein would be the government saying, oh, inflation is now 1.5%. Uh, and that should assure people that you know things are okay. But the reality on the ground is that, firstly, uh, inflation has been running at much higher than normal in 2022 and 2023. And you know, again, policymakers need to understand inflation rate. Let's say uh, you know five percent. Uh, it wasn't five percent. It was uh, about three to three to four percent in 2022, just after the economy opened up, and then about two point five to three percent in 2023. This is a compounded effect. Right, uh, you know, this is uh, you you know this very well from a you know financial literacy standpoint, uh, and whatever that has gone up, you know, is compounded over two years of higher than normal inflation rate, uh, and at the same time, we're talking about a situation where inflation rate actually doesn't met doesn't measure all the increases of all the goods yep. out there in the market, right? Because it's a you know a selected basket of goods, uh, so even when you say oh inflation rate has gone down to one point five percent. Uh, you know, people are still living with the consequences of the compounding of uh, increase in prices over two years, yep. right? So definitely they would feel it uh, in their pocket. And then uh, couple that with the fact that, you know, we have a weaker ringgit uh, and also the lower disposable income that we talked about just now. Definitely people would feel the pinch and we shouldn't have to be so defensive. Let's say I was the government uh, and try to move on uh, and say that, look, these are things in the past. Let's move, let's move to the future acknowledge some of our current challenges and, and weaknesses, but also move to the future to show that this is the kind of strategy we want moving forward to uh, increase your, your disposable income, to increase your income, uh, to, to make life generally better for you. So we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back and talk about the five areas where the government can do ac actual items and initiatives to improve your livelihood. Be right back. Hey everyone, just in case you're wondering, how do we stay updated to news every day? Well, there is an easy way. We actually have a newsletter called The Coffee Break, where we help you stay updated to the latest news in Malaysia and around the world in just three minutes. So every day, there'll be a newsletter sent to your mailbox directly to help you get smarter. Do check out The Coffee Break via the link below. Welcome back to the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about public policies in ways that are relevant to you, the man and the woman on the street. And we were talking about the GDP numbers just before this, yes. uh, Peter. I thought that uh, you know it was a good reminder for you during the uh, from from you during the break that I should explain a little bit about what GDP is, especially to our younger audience. <laughs> Economics one hundred and one. Economics one hundred and one. Yes. Uh, so GDP means gross domestic product. Uh, simply put, it means all the products and services that are produced in within the borders of a country. Uh, and uh, the Department of Statistics, uh, together with Bank Negara, collects this information from different sources. They put, they put it together. Uh, and these figures are announced on a quarterly basis. So mm. every quarter, they will announce uh, the GDP figure of the most recent quarter. So uh, now in February, they, they announced the quarterly results of the GDP changes in GDP for the fourth quarter of 2023. Mm. So, yeah, it's broken down into different sectors and I think uh, you've also read some yeah. description of this uh, information. I was thinking, can we actually break it down in such a way that it's uh, even more layman, right? Let's say we talk about this cup of Zeus coffee. Mm. How does it contribute to the GDP numbers? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it would be contributing uh, in terms of how much uh, the coffee is sold to the consumer mm. uh, and, you know, that 
in itself is a product and then let's say you talk about a service uh, you know people who provide services in the accounting sector for example yep. in the financial services sector they will also be producing a service uh, and that is also calculated as part of the uh, yep. larger gdp or national accounts yep so in that sense basically what it's trying to say is that uh the n- the amount of business that is in the most layman manner, the amount of business, business economic activity, yeah, economic yes. activities that's being produced within the nation. Yeah. Yeah. So if there is the highest, the numbers are higher, basically means that there's more business. Ah. More economic yeah, activity. More economic activity. Yeah. But mm. when there is the number is lower, means that economic activity is slowing down. Like during COVID, right? for example. So now with GDP not meeting target, right? I think there's two sides of the story to this whole thing. Number one, uh, maybe you can take us back a little bit to the curtain once again, right? Mm. Like, how does a politician or how does ministers actually respond to this? What comes across their mind? Because for the man on the street, we talked about it earlier just now. Mm. For most of us, actually, you won't really feel it mm. unless you're doing business, lah, sure. right? You won't really feel it. Now, But for a minister, what actually goes through their mind, actually? Okay, so you have to understand there's actually an ecosystem surrounding, uh, you know, GDP numbers. Uh, When these are announced, usually it's by Bank Nagara, the governor will be there. Uh, They usually, you know, there will be other people uh, who are at the briefing, uh, uh, reporters, uh, as well as now, I think Bank Nagara has introduced a setting whereby... um, fund managers and uh, those interested in the in the uh, investing in the Malaysian economy would also be invited mm. right and they have an opportunity to ask questions right uh, and the ba- and bank Nagara also has to issue statements to explain the GDP growth uh, and let's say if let's say there are some areas where the GDP growth uh, contracted uh, or did not increase as much they also have to explain so for example I think you know during the break you pointed out that uh, even as GDP grew by three uh, percent in the fourth quarter, Exports actually fell by about seven or eight uh, percent. Manufacturing output fell by about two or three percent. So all these things contributed to uh, you know uh, lowering of the uh, you know not meeting the the target of four percent. Uh, and all these things have to be explained by the uh, central bank governor uh, and also uh, the ministers who are part and parcel of the economy ecosystem. So it will usually be uh, the minister of finance, the minister of economy and also the uh, Minister of Investment, Trade and Industry. Mm. They will have to come up with different angles or different ex- uh, different explanations to sort of like uh, couch uh, the, the numbers right. and then uh, to see what kind of narrative they want to give moving forward. Right, right, mm. I see. Yeah. So when, when, when these numbers are being announced, actually a lot of the things that goes through the minds of uh, ministers or necessary department is a lot about managing the stakeholders, uh, including the stakeholders <coughs> of Rakyat lah. I suppose. Uh, yeah, so so Rakyat will also read what these newspaper reporters write about or what these analysts will you know uh, write in their own analyst reports uh, because the newspapers would say, look, your expectation was 4%. Now it's 3.7%. People may not understand the impact of GDP on themselves, but when they read the papers, they read the headlines, mm. uh, economic growth target not met. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's that's something that the politicians and the policymakers have to manage. So I think for this time round, uh, the narrative that's been given by uh, by the, the unity government is that GDP growth is normalizing. The word is normalizing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, basically saying that, you know, we are normalizing to a post-COVID environment whereby we have to contend with different external and internal challenges. GDP growth is still positive, but not as good. And then the narrative moving forward is that it was normalizing during 2023, 2024, we are hope we are hopeful that it will be uh, better than 2023. Yeah. That is the kind of narrative that's been right. Made. Right, I yeah. see, I see. Yeah. So, so do you do you do you uh, buy that narrative? Do you are you uh, convinced? I think for me, I kind of expected it. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Simply because uh, we also looked at the U.S. market itself. Uh, because sure. for us, when we look at a lot of the investment news, uh, what we can see is that generally GDP is contracting. Yeah. Uh, in some uh, of the developed uh, developed yeah. countries, yeah, and including UK already, UK, yeah, yeah, enter into a technical recession. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Japan also announced a technical recession. Yeah, yeah. But what we can see at the same time is that the stock market is rising. But that's a whole different topic altogether, lah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The one we leave aside because again, like I said, the people who invest in the stock market usually not the man on the street. Of course, yeah. there are some of our audience <laughs> who do. Uh, you know, we we value your your support as well. Uh, but yeah, for most of the of the people, you know, who are sort of like workers and uh, 
uh, and the like uh, you know they they would be focused on other things that we talked about just yeah. now like inflation like uh, rises in the cost of living like uh, you know stagnant incomes and things like that yeah. Yeah. Oh, i want to go into the first point that you actually mentioned because uh, you sent me the article that you actually wrote in mm. uh, to malaysia kini and uh, other news newspaper outlets that mm. picked it up as well yeah was the first thing that you mentioned government should acknowledge the challenges in that they are facing in managing the economy stop blaming past government but the other part that you actually put out here is to bring because when they do this it makes them seems ineffective to the public mm. and it also take attention away from some of the positive government policy which has been announced such as the netter national energy transition roadmap and the new industrial master plan 2030 yeah. which I thought that was a very valid point hmm. because ever since the announcement of Netta and this uh, new industrial master plan which it's actually pretty exciting people are waiting yeah there's no news any correct <laughs> now is all the other funky funky <laughs> news that in my opinion it causes a lot of uh, a lot of uh, noise in the market hmm. but doesn't really bring true value on us as a right up what can we do exactly so my first point you know my advice or recommendation to the government was to stop blaming stop blaming the, the 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 past issues and and move forward uh you know the the second recommendation is to actually announce uh, policies and also programs initiatives that will roll out whatever that has been announced in the budget in the the, the national energy transition mode roadmap in the NIMP 2030 so that businesses and also you know others individuals can get excited Uh, ab- about these uh, policies these positive policies mm. uh, and i think they are still discussing you know in the ministry of finance and with the other ministries but i think the fact that you have this negative news coming out uh, actually shows the importance of having a positive agenda that you can put out there to the yeah. public so that you can you know shape the the new positive narrative for 2024 correct Yeah. yeah. Since you're quite clear about the new industrial master plan and the netter, right? Mm. W- would you like to uh, maybe explain to the public a little bit what are these two things? Uh, what are some of the opportunities that mm. that the man on the street can actually uh, grab hold of to maybe increase their income in the future? Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, one one very simple thing would be uh, something called net energy metering, uh, meaning that if let's say I'm going to uh, install solar panels. Uh, and sell it back to the grid uh, i will be able to have cost savings right and this is especially important for businesses uh, maybe less so for individuals but individuals still put uh, this uh, these kinds of solar panels yeah. on, it, on their roof and whatnot so if let's say government can announce policies that can help especially businesses uh, to install more re to be able to do net energy metering uh, then they will be able to save more uh, electricity costs uh, electricity mm. uh, bills uh, because as a result of something called the industry cost pass through mechanism uh you know the the industry actually face a huge jump between 30 to 40% in their in their electricity bill at the end of 2022 just after pakatan harapan took over so this is something that you may not know lah but i'll give you a very very simple example uh ironically this is a factory that produces solar panels is a is a multinational right okay they can put um solar panels on their roof Mm-hmm. and sell it back to the grid under the net energy metering mm-hmm. but they don't have approval to put the solar panels on the ground oh because this is considered a separate uh, categorization of solar panels it's got large scale solar so <clears throat> then it means that look i can't put it on the ground it means i don't have even though i have land i can't put it on my right. facility right. right so i save less money you know um, oh and and that's something that Uh, you know the these companies have been trying to advocate for trying to push the energy commission uh, and the ministry of uh, energy to to liberalize that that policy lah mm. so it's it's something quite simple right uh, but you know you need to have certain political will and also processes to be able to push that through mm. uh, and mm. i think uh, this is where i think industry needs to uh, make its voice heard a little bit more mm. so that government can feel these kinds of uh, demands and then mm. uh, do the appropriate action Uh, to mm. undertake this lah. The other one is under NIMP. Uh, there's also uh, funding uh, for uh, some of the pillars, such as uh, net zero. Uh, you know, um, policy that wants to reduce uh, carbon emissions, right? So right. companies want to invest in this. Uh, they want to reduce their carbon footprint, but they're waiting for incentives to be announced from the government. 
uh, whether it is directly from the government or through subsidies, through the private sector, through financial institutions or loans, uh, we're still not quite sure yet. That's why all these things, they need to be pushed out sooner rather yeah, than later. Yeah. I, I, I feel like if uh, government were to put in more uh, effort to explain all this and to drop out a clearer idea of what can I as a man on the street do, mm. I will be ignoring whatever GDP mm. news there. <coughs> uh, I'll be focusing on what I need to do to actually increase my income. Now. For example, I, I think a lot of people out there, right? maybe they even have certain ideas like, um, oh, maybe now with uh, EV being a popular thing, mm. I may be thinking about bringing in EV bikes to sell sure. because bringing EV cars is very expensive, but bringing EV bikes mm. is actually quite cheap. It's only about like 8,000, 5,000 means that if you have a capital of about 500,000, uh, you, you, you can start trading, selling EV bikes here, right? Yeah, so that's, that's well, what very, do I do? You know? See, that's a very good point because the, the third recommendation I made uh, to the government was that you need to plan ahead, you need to make certain policy commitments clear uh, in terms of the timeline so that people, individuals and businesses can prepare for it. Mm. So you talk about EVs. Uh, one of the reasons why EV adoption has not been that high in Malaysia is because petrol prices are still relatively low. And the government has said, look, this year we're going to roll back diesel subsidies. And then later on, we're going to roll back petrol subsidies. right? But the Rakyat doesn't really know when to expect that. It's somewhere out there, you know, we, mm. we anticipate that will happen. Uh, but there's no sort of like a concrete timeline. Let's say by third quarter, diesel subsidies are going to be reduced. Uh, by uh, you know end of second quarter or beginning of third quarter, we're going to reduce back some of the petrol subsidies. And the government actually has space to do that because you're not going to have elections for another three or four years. Yeah. Right. So why not make that announcement clear so that people can start planning? And on the EV side, uh, I, I'm not sure whether you know this, the government under METI has pushed forward a policy whereby for uh, people who are buying uh, motorcycle EVs, you yeah. are eligible to a 2,500 ringgit. That's right. Yeah, because you, you've had discussion with the That's right. minister on this. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, we need to push that message out and this can be part and parcel of a larger national agenda of saying, look, uh, we want you to transition from uh, you know petrol to EVs. We're going to give you subsidies. At the same time, expect diesel and petrol subsidies to increase. And there's also another very important point. When you want to do targeted subsidies, which is what this government has promised, you need to let the people know in advance. Look, <laughs> uh, you know we are gonna give you some money to replace the the increase in the, the the petrol prices, and this is the amount that we're gonna give to you. We're gonna give to you an extra, you know, uh, one hundred ringgit a month for those who are eligible. Maybe those who are, have been getting this uh, sumbangan uh, tunai ruma or bantuan yep. tunai uh, uh, rama. Uh, so that people can plan accordingly, right? So that you can do your proper budgeting so that you know this is what the government is trying to do to help us. And then the GDP figures doesn't become so important. You know, you can anticipate, oh, starting from January, I'm going to get an extra 100 bucks in my in my e-wallet. Uh, but at the same time, I know I have to spend maybe another extra 50 bucks on my petrol That's price. Right. Net, net, I still gain 50 bucks. Yep. Especially if, let's say, you are in the B40 or maybe uh, the M M40 category. That's right. That's right. right. So you know we're we're waiting for these kinds of announcements, lah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think there are some things that needs to be very clear for the public because, and like you say, there is actually time before the next election, and it's best to actually start telling all this right now because people, yes, they all will be disappointed. Mm. We all will be disappointed. Some more than others, yeah. Especially yeah. those driving big cars yeah. or their Mercedes and BMW. Yeah, people but it's okay, it's okay. They can disappointed, it. but yeah. people also forget after that, mm. and once they forget what they want to see is how you manage it through and how you manage it out of that situation yep. and help us to get adapted to it, right? Yep. And that's where telling us a little bit earlier on when certain subsidy relief will be taken away, right? Uh, and what are some of the things that we can look forward to? Instead, one part they did very, very fast. Mm. Yeah. Announcing when will... Uh, the tax for EV cars normalize. <laughs> okay. uh, the one came out very fast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. year is that? What year is that? Just for Four our audience. Five. Yes. Yeah. And no. I looked at that. Mm. I was thinking to myself, you know, mm. with all the effort that you are trying to push forward for EV adoption, right? Yeah. Why not extend it, right? Yeah. Give and it to 2028. That mm. one, you're so effective to straight away tabulate out the number mm. two to five. This, how much are you gonna get? Mm. Immediately, right? The talk of the town was. Luckily, I didn't buy EV. Mm. And you, you know what a lot of people started saying? Mm. By 2025, only start buying EV. Because by then, people will be desperately trying to sell. Mm. Because a BMW iX mm. EV will cost, what? About 
four five thousand ringgit. Mm, you're talking about the road tax. Yeah, la. for road tax, yeah. that mm. number they can come up very fast. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking of myself, right? Like, you know, maybe. Yeah. Make it more aligned. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. So that at Announce least everything uh, as a package so that you'll know. And maybe some of these things you have to adjust, give it a longer time. time yes. Again, an example. Uh, you know, Singapore recently uh, increased their GST, increased mm. it by 1%. Uh, they, they started it, uh, you know, started the increase this year. Uh, but they had already announced that 1% increase in GST from a year ago. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and. In anticipation of this uh, increase, they also announced uh, an increase in the uh, amount allocated to these uh, things called the CDC, mm. the community, uh, you know, uh, sort of like uh, uh, vouchers uh, that people would be able to use these vouchers to spend on other things, mm. right? Um, the elderly, the, the, the less affluent. Uh, and this is a way where you can actually plan to say that, okay, I'm going to tax you more but I'm going to give you back even more to certain communities using these kinds of mechanisms. And the government in Malaysia can do the same to say that, look, you may end up spending 50 ringgit more on petrol, but we're going to give you back more, 100 ringgit a month through these, uh, through these uh, you know, uh, targeted subsidies that we are going to give to the B40 and maybe lesser amount to the M40. But yeah. that, that isn't being done. Yeah, yeah. Absolute, I think yeah. that communication has to be much more coordinated again. Yeah. And also the overall uh, rollout of the kind of incentives how they should package it in the full narrative to show people, right? Like, for example, maybe even like the the, the taxation part, right? I, I think it's fair. Like, maybe you can say like, if you're buying a BMW EV, then the tax is <laughs> going to be like that. But if you buy EVs that are below a certain price, then... Yeah, you know, below 100,000, below 200,000, then the tax rate will be much reduced. Like. Yeah, then yeah. It, it would make a lot more sense. Yeah. And people will feel that like, yeah, you are really taking care of us in a more I, coordinated manner. I would even make the argument to say that even for BMW EVs, you should give uh, good incentive because you're you're trying to uh, to change people's habits and all Agreed. that. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, I know a few friends who drive the i7. So, you know. <laughs> it's a nice car. It's a very, very nice, nice car. car. Very nice car. You know, so, okay. Uh, two, more, two more recommendations before we go to the next session section. Um, one is, uh, this is the fourth one. Uh, we should announce catalytic uh, economic catalytic projects or initiatives that have significant multiplier effects. Mm. Announce and also implement them. Yep. Right. So I'm not sure whether you remember, last year, the tourism minister announced that there will be a new categorization of Malaysia My Second Home into platinum, gold and silver categories. Yes. So when people heard that, they were very excited. Yes. Right? Uh, you know, want to uh, get peop more people to sign up, foreigners, expats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but till now, we haven't seen this policy being actualized yet. Mm. Right. So, you know, if let's say that could be done, then people will get excited. You know, people will say that, hey, this government is very, being very proactive. Of course, uh, there are some who will attack the government saying, oh, you're letting all these, uh, you know, nationals from China, from certain countries to come in. Uh, and then, you know, they will try to, to, to politicize it, make it, make it into a 3R issue. But I think the government, you know, has been quite smart. They say, okay, we're going to give it to, you know, different countries, uh, whoever is uh, eligible at these three levels. Uh, and this will help the property sector. Yes. This will help the retail sector. Uh, this will help even the education sector because you have people who then move here and then their kids uh, would go to the uh, private universities, and yeah. including my own, you know. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that would be a sort of like a positive effect in terms of this multiplier effect. Yeah. Um, another one would be, uh, why not make an announcement on the uh, MRT3 project? Right? Because it, it is the circle line that will connect uh, people to MRT line one and two. Yes, you know, it could be a bit expensive, uh, but again, that will have catalytic uh, sort of like uh, implications and also multiply effect uh, on the construction sector. Yeah. And then not just the construction sector, but all those people who supply to the construction yeah. sector, your, your steel players, your cement players, and that will yeah. give impetus to more economic activity. Even the small garai nearby there also will feel the effects. Yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 And more, so these kind of things, yeah. like you say, right, it, it gives a more direct impact to Rakyat and they will feel that uplift immediately, uh, rather than just looking at GDP numbers, right? Mm. Or FDIs, which takes a quite exactly. long time before it, it comes to actualized. fruition. Yes. Yeah, like if, if you say that just by allowing MM2H, within the next few months, you're going to see application. Yeah. You're going to see a property market pick up. Yeah. And when people move in, you're going to see the birth of new stalls around mm. there. All these kind of things are going to start happening and within a year, the effects can be filled already. Exactly. Yeah. So the last point, the last recommendation, and this is something that you would, uh, you know, know how you would speak more, more knowledgeably than me, would be to have a consistent communications policy. 
mm. right? That's always something that we half thought not just us but others as well. You know, for example, uh, there was this announcement of a new uh, Beras Madani uh, <laughs> at uh, you know thirty uh, ringgit for ten yeah. ten kilos. Yeah, that one. yeah, and then later on, you know, this was announced by you know an MP from Bukit Degantang that used to be that that is from Bersatu but is now supporting the government. Uh, and then later on, the government came out to say, you know, the Minister of Communications, the Minister of Agriculture came out to say, actually, the cabinet hasn't decided. Then you're wondering, hey, where's the communications strategy in this, you know? Uh, you, you, let, uh, you let a normal MP who's in charge of one uh, particular uh, council to make this announcement and, and the rest of the government is like, you know, trying to play catch up, so to speak. Yep. Right? So what do you think, you know, in terms of the communication strategy here? I think there should be number one a uh, WhatsApp group <laughs> among everyone. Uh, and, they, they, uh, they, I think they, they have a WhatsApp group among the ministers. Uh, uh, but but unfortunately, Rafizi is not in there because he doesn't have WhatsApp. That's <laughs> 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 ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, a bit of a joke. Yeah, but anyways, yeah, so, go on. Yeah. So, is it really he doesn't have WhatsApp? Uh? Yeah, yeah, he does. does oh, it really? Yeah, we have a separate conversation oh, okay, okay. on this. But right. just for the record, <laughs> it is something that oh. he has admitted that oh, he okay. does not have WhatsApp. Okay, okay. Yeah, for, for, for mental health issues. Yeah. Yeah. I I am starting to realize like uh, even in the company, generally everyone has certain instruction and you don't simply talk, right? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think they, like among MPs, there should have been some sort of a system in place, right? Uh, yeah. And, and also among no, the cabinet members. Like, nonetheless, yeah. it's fair and fine to say that not everyone will listen hmm. and everyone is free to just speak out because everyone also needs to show their part. But I think it's very important for every single government to anchor point one thing and say that, okay, time to time, like maybe a, a, a weekly basis, there will be the Jabatan Penerangan coming out and, and verify different kind of things or speak up on different kind of things. And that will be the trusted source. So what will happen moving ahead, right? Maybe initially it will feel like it's a catch-up game. Lah. Mm. But at least once you're appointed that, you announce it, right? Mm together with a coordinated strategy, maybe after about six months, people will start realizing that I should only listen to the weekly one to verify. Mm. Yeah, because you set that anchor point there. Mm. Um, it's just like us coming out of a newsletter or something like that. And I think the American government actually does that, right? You can actually go and like download mm. the bills or something like that. No, you can, there are ways proposal, to verify, although you know, they have also challenges yeah. with fake news. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's a good yeah, suggestion. So I think that should be something that can yeah, be done. So, you know, friends from JCOM, you know, maybe you can do something that's uh, better coordinated and, and work with the minister, uh, Minister Fami, to, to make this yeah. happen uh, in the... The, the near near future. So yeah, maybe we stop there for now and then we come back and we talk about another interesting topic. Mm. Maybe before the last one, right? Okay. Before we go, I just have to add this. Right? Okay. I think Malaysia should allow more concerts because oh. uh, we are actually a good destination for concerts. Sure, sure. Yeah? Yes. Uh, K-pop itself is a very big thing here. Mm. Yeah, uh, but every time when we have concert, there's a lot of noise going around. Uh, and very vocal minority. Very vocal minority. Mm. But I think it will uplift the GDP very very well and it will be something that locals can really feel the impact yeah, 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 yeah. and the uplift of it because just look at it in Singapore uh, we just came out with a post about it that in Singapore Taylor Swift actually had to deal with the Singapore government to actually perform exclusively there and mm. she was actually paid 13 million per show 13.4 mm. million Malaysian so this is exclusive to Southeast Asia yes mm. and with that it actually probably brought in by estimation uh, about 158 million sing dollars mm. worth of revenue. Multiply effect. Yeah. Multiply effect. That's right. And and these are just numbers that you are talking about could be captured. What about mm. things that could not be captured? Like mm. just that simple lollipop being sold by that uncle mm. who's riding that bike, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. Or the mineral yeah. water that could be sold in Bukit Jalil when there's That's a concert, right. you know? Yeah. So yeah. all these things are part and parcel of how we can generate more economic activity. Hope that the government is listening, the re relevant ministries, uh, and uh, hope that we can have a much more coordinated strategy moving forward. Uh, That's right. The government. Yeah. Okay, be right back. Welcome back to the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about public policy in ways that are relevant to you. We are brought to you by Zeus Coffee, where coffee is a necessity, not a luxury. We're going to go into this segment talking about babies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, making babies. <laughs> uh, this was a statement that was uh, issued uh, by a friend of mine, uh, YB Simzi Zin, uh, the MP for Bayan Baru in uh, Penang and also the former Deputy Agriculture Minister. Mm. Uh, 
so I think he saw some of the stats that were issued by the Department of Statistics and that uh, very few Chinese babies were being born. Uh, mm. And he asked the Chinese community, you know, for the sake of patriotism and other things, <laughs> uh, you should have more <laughs> babies. And, uh, you know, one example that he pointed to is that if you don't have enough Chinese babies, uh, then it will affect the viability of uh, Chinese schools in, in yeah. Asia. So when you read the news, you know, what, what, what did you think about that? Uh, I think it's uh, quite interesting because actually today many of the Chinese schools are not fully attended by Chinese. Half of them are actually non-Chinese. Mm. Yeah, there are quite many Malays who actually uh, enroll themselves or enroll their kids, right? Yeah. For uh, I think Chinese the education. national percentage in terms of non-Malay, uh, sorry, non-Chinese enrollment into Chinese primary schools is probably somewhere between 50 to 20%. Mm. Uh, and I could see that trend increasing. Uh, and again, you know, based on some of my travels around uh, Malaysia, uh, there are many schools, Chinese schools, uh, in Sarawak, and to a lesser extent Sabah, but definitely in Sarawak, where the majority of the students are actually uh, Ibans, you know, Ibans, yeah. uh, uh, Bidayus, and basically non-Chinese. A mm. majority, you know, that means more than fifty <laughs> percent, right? So I, I, I think you know maybe just to uh, as a more direct response to to Sim, uh, you know, to preserve Chinese schools, uh, you don't really need to have all Chinese go there, right? Yep. You could have you know, a system where it's, if it's good enough, you can get uh, non-Chinese to attend uh, those That's schools right. as well. That's right, yeah. yeah. And in fact, probably I would say, you know, the, the Chinese school themselves and even some associations like Tong Zhong and all that, they should make these schools more attractive to more parents. Mm. Uh, not just Chinese parents, uh, but non-Chinese parents, especially from the perspective of teaching more creativity, more critical thinking, because one of the criticisms that even some Chinese parents have of Chinese schools is that uh, the system is very rigid. Mm. Uh, doesn't really encourage, uh, you know, very critical thinking. A lot of it is uh, learning by road and things like that. Mm. W- mm. Was did, was that your experience? Did uh, you go to Chinese, Chinese school? school? Yeah, I went to Chinese school. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I studied Chinese all the way until I was form five. Oh wow! So, uh, okay. so was I your didn't SPM? Went to independent. Your, your SPM Chinese school is a, uh, uh, you know, C B A standard was. I got A. Oh, it uh, was very good already. Very hard to get on. Uh. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, because okay. my my family is actually very. Uh, Rooted in the Chinese culture. Okay. My okay. mom is actually a first generation Chinese. Oh. She okay, was actually okay. born in China. Ah. She only came here when she was three years old. Ah. My father is a second gen. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So my uh like in terms of like knowing the Chinese culture and mm. literature wise, uh I'm quite okay with okay, that. Okay, okay. Yep. Yeah. But mm. yes, I do agree that when it comes to Chinese school, uh I have seen quite a lot of people, especially from independent school, as an employer, lah, huh, when I look at it, independent school students tend to be very rigid. Mm. And they are very hardworking, but they lack the ability to be creative mm. very often. That That's my, okay, my observation okay. uh, and my experience in hiring. Mm. Uh, in terms of Chinese school during my days, uh, are we very rigid? I don't think so. I think it was quite okay, but definitely it's a lot more stricter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Discipline-wise. Uh, a lot yeah. more, yeah, discipline. Uh, and the expectation a lot more higher. Mm. Yeah, that that I can say for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but I think, you know, the underlying question, you know, that uh, YB Sim is asking, or Sim as I call him, is asking is, uh, you know, why are Chinese in Malaysia having less babies? Right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think we should try to explore those areas you know that are important to to policy makers and policy right. thinking uh, because this is something that's actually not unique to the chinese community in malaysia uh, in in asia can you guess the country that has the lowest uh, birth rate singapore no i think korea is worse it's oh. less than one <laughs> because of a lot of reasons uh, um the you know bringing up kids is expensive housing is expensive yes. especially in seoul uh, there's also a lot of pressure on uh, on women uh, in terms of certain family mm. expectations and uh, you know the the sort of like a hierarchy of women in in a place like Korea although is changing uh, is also you know come coming under a lot of uh, uh, stress yeah uh, very patriarchal kind of society right so I am not saying that Malaysia is like that but I think we need to understand that there are similar pressures that's right uh, facing the 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 you know, not just the Chinese community but but other communities that's in right. Malaysia as well yeah. So here's what I want to point out, right? Uh, I, I understand that he's trying to say that, uh, you know, Chinese community is not giving birth uh, enough. And, and the statistic is quite staggering, which actually shocked me, about 400 over 1,000 babies that were born in uh, 2022. Mm. Only 40,000 40, yeah. are mm. 
Chinese mm. babies. And yeah. uh, I, I'm glad that my kid is 2022. <laughs> I've contributed to that uh, one of the 40,000. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Now, however, I think in terms of policy-wise, the narrative should not have been focusing towards the Chinese community. Yeah, but should not be urban. a racial one. Uh, yeah. yeah, shouldn't be a racial one. It should mm. be an urban one. Because I believe, although without any evidence, but digging deeper into the statistic, you may likely find generally urban population have a lower birth rate. Yeah, for those yeah. reasons we talked about just now. Yeah, and, and, and this is the same globally. Any countries in the world, the more developed you are, the less babies you have. Correct. It's just because of people having more options and a higher standard of living, people realize that without baby, I can travel more, I can enjoy my life more, I can do a lot more things. Mm. I mean, we are not living like those days where there's nothing much better to do after work, right? Today, there's plenty of <laughs> yes, entertainment. Yes, yes, there's a lot yeah? of options, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, full, full disclosure. Like for me, I'm married. Twenty years this year, but I don't have any kids. So mm. that gives me a lot of flexibility. Uh, thank you very much for contributing to my lack of a quote, lack of uh, <laughs> achievement in terms of contributing in that way. But I hope I'm hopefully contributing in uh, other ways. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, you know, that that is a that is a public policy issue that we need to address. Of course. Um, uh, there are other public policy ways in which we can address this kind of uh, you know uh, declining birth rate. Uh, a country like Japan, for example, mm. they have ha always had this uh, you know aging population and, and decreasing population trend. Uh, and you know one of the ways in which uh, countries like the U.S. have arrested this this decline uh, is to have a more open immigration policy. Mm. Right. So for us, I think it's something that's a little bit taboo. But you know many people do want to come and live and work here in Malaysia. Uh, and if let's say we put in certain conditions, you know, uh, on the sort of like uh, older side, we can have MM2H and then on the others, we can have more qualified uh, skilled workers, those who have studied here in higher education institutions to have a pathway to at least get PR. And then, you know, that, that would be a way in which we can address some of these uh, population uh, issues. La. But of course, we also cannot, uh, you know, deny that there's a political dimension to this. Mm. Right, in the sense that if you have fewer Chinese babies, it means you have fewer Chinese voters, right? <laughs> uh, which means that you know parties, including you know my my own party DAP, that caters more towards the Chinese crowd or the non-Malay crowd, may find that it is getting squeezed into a smaller and smaller box, yeah. So the the reaction to this shouldn't be to say that hey, we should have more babies, you know, which may not necessarily work. You know, we're not going to take family planning advice from a political party, right? But from a perspective of of a political party like mine. Uh, would be to try to be more inclusive. Yeah. To reach out to more people, to have a party that reflects more in terms of the demographic of the country. Having more That's Indians, right. having more Malays, having more uh, Orang Asli, you know, having more Orang Asal from uh, Sabah and Sarawak to join the party. Yeah. Right? So, and to broaden our appeal, I think... You know, I, I think that's part and parcel of why Sim is uh, a bit, right. uh, a bit uh, you know, concerned. Uh, but I think we need to have a larger con uh, con con conversation about the reasons why. And then also, you know, to talk about some of the political uh, implications of this and how we want to address this uh, as a country. Yeah. So if you were to talk about uh, two sides of the story, I think number one, uh, as, a, as the right yard, like, I personally think that there are certain policies that can be put in place, uh, aside from immigration, which also will lead to that, uh, the political part, yeah, which we will touch on as well, some of my thoughts on it. Um, is the other part in terms of what are some policies that government can do? Uh, the only country that I've seen it does quite well is actually Singapore, right? Uh, what do I mean by that is not just the open thing part, is the part about how they actually subsidize childcare, oh, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is a very expensive thing in here. The more urbanized, the more expensive childcare yeah, so, so is. It's so expensive in Singapore, but yeah. they, you know, they put resources behind it. Yeah, they it. really put resources behind it. So when I asked them, they told me that uh, when you give birth in Singapore, what happens is... Uh, you will get a subsidy up to 20,000 per child. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the first thing that happened is your daycare will only cost 400 sing dollar, which if you're earning about 4,000 sing dollars and 400 sing dollars is, mm -hmm. is very cheap. Malaysia, daycare is 1,000 per month. Yeah, per month. yeah, yeah very that's expensive. 400. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot cheaper. And that's why the other day uh, in our last episode, remember I was saying that uh, I don't see a government childcare facility around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because as a parent, I really don't see many. I was trying to look for it and I really don't see many. Yeah. Uh, and in Singapore, they have that. Uh, number two, they also even have like, uh, for example, 
they al- they have this proximity grant when you buy houses which allow mm. you to stay near to parents, your parents uh, yeah. which mm. means when you're near to your parents your parents can kind of help a help, little bit yeah, to take care of the kids yeah. you know because let's face the truth Malaysia have even bigger geographic area mm. if your parents are in Kelantan mm. and you're living in KL mm. you're going to give birth mm. Mm. let's say both of your b- both you and your spouse both of you work yeah. right then you know definitely you have to have a uh, childcare and That's let's right. say childcare is not very accessible or very expensive it would be a problem yeah so that mm. allows you to like like buy a property near your your parents or something i mean maybe it's hard for you to go back to london but there could be some work around playing with that and some sort of things <coughs> and, so and and make make childcare facilities and childcare as a occupation uh, more more accessible more you know more professional you know and uh, you know make it something that more people can have access to and then the average mm. cost may be able to go down as well. Yeah, I, th- I think like um, government actually did mention last time, uh, I remember the time uh, Wabi Hanan Yo was the... Deputy Minister. Uh, Deputy Minister. Yeah. She did talk about like uh, encouraging corporates to actually o- build, open up a, uh, a child care centers, facility, yes, right? Correct, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought that was a good idea, but until yeah. today, I haven't seen it really come into fruition. In government departments, they do already. Yeah, mm. uh, and uh, you know they have a bit more space. Uh, and when I was at Miti, for example, we have a very good uh, you know childcare oh, wow. uh, center there, uh, where where parents can uh, put their kids, especially the younger ones. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think this is also something that you know other corporates should think about. Uh, we haven't really seen a lot of uh, incentives or a lot of uh, yeah. attention being put that way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if let's say the government wants to have that kind of conversation, these are the issues that we need to address. Yeah, maybe like if you build a childcare facility, the childcare facility will be considered a capex mm. uh, so that you can deduct on taxes. Mm. I think many big corporates are happy. Sure. You can even ask them to say that like, oh, open it up to the nearby offices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Make it a business. Yeah, make know? it a business yeah. and mm. stuff like that. I, mm. I, I think that many big corporates will actually do something about it mm. uh, if you match it with the right incentive. Mm. That's number one. Now, uh, on the other hand, when we talk about the voting base, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I think quite many times we had the conversation about DAP and when I asked you this thing, uh, why not? Why I've not seen a Malay uh, DAP leader per se who's prominent enough that's mm. constantly featured. Mm. That's non-existent. Uh, I mean, yeah, they're trying to make more news about it, talk more about uh, one of the lady, Rara, I think. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. one of the three, one of three DAP MP, uh, Malay MPs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think it should be given more coverage and maybe even giving more chances to be appointed in, in leadership positions mm. so that it, it tells the community that DAP is not a Chinese party. Mm. Yeah, it is a, a party for everyone. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I think that's very important as, as the political landscape evolves. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, I fully agree with uh, that kind of approach. Uh, we have three Malay MPs in Peninsula. Uh, we also have, uh, um, we have a native uh, representative, Modi Bimo, uh, in Mas Gading in Sarawak as mm. well. Uh, he's uh, serving his second term. Uh, so we actually need more natives from Sabah and Sarawak to join the party and to be part of the leadership. Uh, and I think it's a process that is not easy because sometimes we do not want to just get people in because of their race and put a quota there. Uh, we want uh, you know people who to join the party regardless of race who can fit into the culture mm. of the party and contribute in ways that I think are more uh, selfless. Uh, like my my successor in Bangi, Asharizan, yeah. is somebody who joined the party with very good intentions, um, not expecting a seat initially. Uh, but one thing to speak up on issues that he feels very strongly about like human rights and mm. uh, a lot of legal issues and i think he has uh, slowly but surely uh, you know transitioned into an mp now he's part of the cec uh, and i hope that he will be able to get a more prominent position uh, within the party leadership mm. sooner rather than later think about it actually does does dap give out scholarships uh? Uh, no, uh, you know, it's not something that we are in a position to do because of our financial resources. Right. Uh, but for MCA, they used to have an yeah. entity called Kojadi. Uh, it's a cooperative that gives out, uh, sco- that gave out scholarship to, to members. Uh, and of course, uh, last time, you know, through Ta College, now it's a full-fledged university, they also uh, gave out scholarships and uh, made education very accessible at the diploma level. Many accountants at that time, uh, you know, trained in uh, Ta College. Uh, of course, I mean that's a that's a separate issue, you know. Uh, you know, in terms of this uh, birth rate issue, maybe I just want to st- uh, end by saying that when you provide these childcare facilities, 
you are also giving more incentives for mothers not just to have kids but to return to the workforce that's right. or to stay in the workforce that's right and that will also uh, you know help the government uh, achieve its uh, objective of having 65% of the female population mm. uh, you know participating in the workforce right now we are at about 57 58% if i'm not yeah. mistaken right so yeah um maybe just stop there for now and then we'll come back and talk about the birthday that i attended last sunday of an important individual be right back Okay, this is the final section of episode 12. 12 yep. episodes already. Uh, you know, the last episode that dropped pretty good, uh, but we need you to help us out a little bit more. We're at about 14,800 subscribers. We just mm-hmm. need a few more to reach 15,000. So that will be another milestone for us. So if you are watching this, please uh, click the uh, like as well as more importantly, the subscribe button. Do you think it would be cool uh, if let's say we hit 20,000 subscribers, then we do a live session. Like oh. live, not as in video, you know. We okay. get a space, yep. we do it like Kelpop Fest at that. Mm. We, on the spot, do live one where people can ask us questions. Okay, okay. So if let's say you want us to do a live show, uh, please indicate in the comments and then maybe give some suggestions on the possible venues that we can have this live show. Definitely keen to do that to get more people, uh, you know, to come and interact and talk to us and ask us uh, difficult questions, you know, like uh, why am I always wearing bate? You know, why are you always <laughs> wearing shirts that are very boring? You know, uh, what's your tattoo about? You know, what, what what does it say on it? You know, so all these more <laughs> personal questions, happy to take take these questions. Yeah. Most important is if you want to see that, you got to share. And you get a like, you get a subscribe, and yep. uh, get your friends to do it, right? Yes, exactly. So uh, for this last segment, uh, we're going to talk about a birthday party, uh, a birthday celebration, a birthday dinner that I attended last mm. Sunday. Uh, today is Tuesday, uh, 20th of February, but uh, you know the dinner that I attended uh, was an early celebration of Tan Sri Lim Kit Siang's birthday. Ooh. Happy birthday, Tan Sri. Today is your actual birthday, but two days ago on Sunday, we celebrated your 83rd birthday uh, at the uh, M Hotel uh, in mm. Section 16 at KGPA. Happy birthday, Tan Sri. Yeah, so I, you know, wanted to, before I share my own thoughts, you know, I wanted to sort of like ask you, you know, since you're a bit younger than me, uh, you know, what is sort of like your uh, exposure, exposure uh, and your experience in terms of uh, thinking and thinking about and reading about uh, Tan Sri Lim Kit Siang? Oh, uh, it changed a lot over the years. I remember when I was a kid, I used to think that the whole DAP is communist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Why, why, why is that? Why is that the case? Um, I think it's because many number one, uh, my parents kind of kind of said a little bit about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, my dad was quite friendly with uh, MCA ah, to start okay, with, okay, okay. Uh, and when I went to school, I recall a lot of teachers were were kind of like linking DAP with with communists, communists also. Okay. And they would like say about like, oh, so that like philosophy, what, what, uh, so communist party, uh, for example, in here, uh, the party that's very prone to China will be DAP. Lah. Oh, uh, okay. like, like that. So they uh. didn't directly say, but they kind of hinted, hinted in that, such okay, a way. Okay, okay. Mm. And it gave me this impression that, that DAP was a communist party. Okay. So I was very scared of DAP. And okay. then when they talk about Lim Ki Siang, right? Uh, it's like time, the leader of the communist uh, party. It's like the leader <laughs> of the communist party. Okay. And he is uh, a person who is uh, causing a lot of troubles in Malaysia. Okay. Uh, that was the impression that I got, got all along. Uh, so uh, a troublemaker communist leader. Yeah, a troublemaker communist leader. And okay. then uh, uh, even went to jail for Operation Lalang, you okay. know, kind okay. of things. Yeah. Uh, only until I was in like maybe university days, I start to realize that hey, it is not entirely true. Mm. The, 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 the narration I'm is glad, I'm glad, very yeah. biased <laughs> actually. Okay, yeah. yes, okay. uh, but I, I couldn't care less about politics during sure. those days. Uh. So it's just like, oh, okay, he's not communist now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yep. Then only until recently, uh, when I started doing the channel more and definitely doing business and everything all, you, you're more concerned about the tax money. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah? Yep. And uh, after the 1MDB case, then it got me to realize that like, hey, actually a lot of things that he did was mm. quite, 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 uh, quite significant to the nation. Mm. Um, Raising up a lot of uh, questions about yes, different scandals and, that happened And putting his own life and family on the line many times sure. just mm. to persist on a principle that he believed uh, to be right. Yeah, so just to clarify, you know, especially to those who may not be familiar with DAP's ideology, 
Uh, DAP is a social democratic party. We're not communists. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, you know, for a long period of time, before we got into power in 2018, we had no ties with the Chinese Communist Party in China. Because for them, when they started going out and engaging, they only engage with uh, parties that are in government. Uh, so they engage much more with AMNO than and, and MCA than with uh, oh. DAP. <laughs> right? So, you know, that that is so, sort of like something that's really from, from left field, a lot of... Um, uh, you know, untruths and also uh, very warped propaganda. Uh, you know, but, you know, going back to Kit Siang, I think he's somebody who was very idealistic right from the start, who was very politically engaged. Uh, he was a uh, cup reporter, you know, a young reporter for uh, Straits Times Singapore. Uh, and, uh, you know, after that, he was for a short period of time the political secretary to uh, the only PAP, M uh, M uh, the only PAP member that actually won a seat uh, in the 19... Uh, the 1964 parliamentary elections in Malaysia, uh, Devan Nair, who later became uh, president of Singapore. Mm. Uh, so Kit Siang was his political secretary for a while. Uh, and he's, you know, gone through a lot of uh, challenging times, you know. Uh, he's been to jail a few times, arrested. Uh, he's the only MP uh, probably in the world, you know, not just in Malaysia, that has represented, if I'm not mistaken, um, f let's see, five constituencies in five states. Mm. So he represented uh, Malacca, uh, Malacca town. Uh, he represented uh, Damansara in PJ. Uh, he represented, of course, uh, in in um, uh, Penang. Uh, you know, he represented uh, the you know uh, seat uh, in in Penang for quite some time. Uh, and after that, he went to Ipoh uh, because he lost in 1999 in in Penang. Uh, and he won a seat there in 2004. And then after that, finally, he went to Johor, uh, you know, his, uh, his uh, birth state uh, and won a state, uh, won a parliamentary seat there in 2013, right? So mm. really impressive, uh, paving new ground, taking a lot of risks uh, so that uh, others can uh, try to follow in his footsteps. And he's left an uh, impressive legacy. Many people in the party look up to him. Uh, many people are trying to walk in his footsteps, uh, but I think... Uh, many people would fail to reach the kind of high standards that he has uh, achieved for himself. Mm. Yeah. So what about yourself? When you first joined uh, DAP, right? Uh, what did you thought of this man, uh, Lim Kit Siang? Because during the time, he wasn't a country yet. Mm. Yeah, uh, it was a relatively, uh, you know, not a very strong party per se. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, just mm. a lot of noise during the time. And mm. for most people, when they joined politics during those days, right? Mm their first choice would have been MZA. Sure, uh, yeah, I mean, number one, yeah. what they say is, uh, mm. uh, at least you're already in power, mm. there's money yeah, to be made, mm. there's power to be made, there's a lot of things to be made. Mm. Uh, taking the stance to join DAP was uh, something that's very, very high risk, I would say, Yeah, in, yeah. in a lot of other people's eye. And so for you, mm. making a decision to join DAP during the time and seeing this man, what was it like? So I think Kit Siang was always the moral compass for the party for me. Uh, one being able to to think strategically for the party, being able to make certain decisions that would be good for the party and more importantly for the country, right? And I saw this in action when uh, you know after I joined the party and I was I was elected as an MP, uh, you know managed to see him up close and personal. Uh, and one of the strategic decisions he made before the 2018 uh, general elections was to uh, float the idea of uh, actually working with Mahathir. Because that time Mahathir was coming back to criticize Najib. And then later he also floated the idea of having Mahathir as the Prime Minister candidate for oh, Pakatan wow. Harapan. So he paved the way for that because a lot of people in DAP obviously had so much animosity towards Mahathir, uh, you know, because of his time and his record as Prime Minister. Uh, but if let's say Kit Siang, a man who was put in jail by Mahathir uh, under Operasi Lalang, could accept Mahathir as the leader of the uh, the opposition coalitions then, then other people would say, okay, I can accept because Kit Siang has made that endorsement. Yeah. So that is the kind of uh, forward thinking that he had for the party and for the country. Uh, the second I example I want to give in terms of how forward looking he is, is his uh, entry into IT issues. He wrote a book in the 1990s called IT for All. And this was at the start of the mm. multimedia super corridor. You know, uh, we were just getting email and internet. And he, you know, was very forward thinking and trying to push the party uh, and leaders to, 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 to get into uh, these kinds of areas in terms of technology and whatnot. You know, so now even now he's 
uh, advising us and getting us to talk about AI and uh, oh, you know big wow. data and things like that. Although he himself is not doing it, uh, but he sees the importance of having these kinds of discussions and pushing ahead. Uh, and probably the last thing I want to say about him is that he really gives the opportunity to younger people. He wants to empower younger people, uh, younger leaders to uh, go out there to do different things. Uh, you know, to to allow, for example, somebody somebody like Tony Po, and in fact encourage uh, him to uh, do these Impian Sarawak Impian Sarawak initi- uh, Sabah initiatives, and uh, he would lead by example. You know, he would go into the the boat to take us to the longhouse to do all these projects. At the opening of some of these uh, projects, he would be there to to you know to to open the tap where we provided water and things like mm. that. Really leading by example, and that's why I think he's somebody who's uh, very much loved within the party. Uh, very respected and uh, somebody I, I think uh, that has definitely left a very positive legacy uh, in the Malaysian uh, political ecosystem. Right, right. Yeah. So if there's one thing that you think uh, Malaysians can learn from him or any up-and-coming political leaders mm. uh, that can learn from him, what will it be? Uh, whether, you, you know, you have to ask yourself whether you're willing to serve uh, without getting the due recognition uh, as a result of your service you know if let's say you think you can do that then i think uh, you know politics would be a good place for you to contribute because that's what lim kit siang did for many years uh, and when we won the 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 general elections in 2018 he did not demand for any positions he de- didn't demand for any posts uh, he just you know uh, was a normal M- mp uh, and only when he retired uh, from politics did he accept the tan sri uh, title Right, so definitely somebody that I think, uh, you know, was very selfless and uh, a good example for young politicians to follow. Mm. Yeah. Then, in terms of as a Malaysian, then right, uh, when we hear the name Tan Sri Lim Kit Siang, what should we remember him as in terms of like his contribution in shaping Malaysia as a nation? I think uh, I've said this in different settings, but I'll repeat it now uh, for the benefit of the audience. In terms of political thinking and progressive thinking, uh, Kit Siang, I would say, is the most important politician in Malaysian history oh. to date. Oh. Because he has been pushing uh, the narrative of an inclusive Malaysia for a long time. Uh, and this would include uh, things like wanting to make sure that everyone is included in the larger Malaysian dream uh, whether it's you know Malay, Chinese, Indian, uh, Orang Asli, uh, you know uh, our native friends from Sabah and Sarawak, he has been pushing that message for a, v- a very very long time, uh, even before Anwar came out to say "woman si ta, woman si we are all part of the same family. Uh, Kishan has been pushing that agenda, and he really uh, lives it and believes it. Uh, there's no ifs and buts about it, and uh, I think that if there was any legacy that we should remember him by. Uh, as a Malaysian, uh, you know, as a towering Malaysian, uh, this would be it. Mm, mm. Yeah. And uh, even though now it seems to be something that is preached by many people, at one point in time, it may not have been so popular even among the DAP because the DAP wanted to see itself, some people, some leaders, wanting, wanted to see itself as primarily a non-Malay or even a Chinese party. Right. right, and he resisted that. You know, some oh. sometimes he paid the price. You know, in terms of support within the party, some people wanted to kick him out and and things like that, or to deprive him of certain leadership positions. But he held strong, and I think uh, you know we are seeing partly uh, the results of his efforts in terms of the opening up of democratic space in Malaysia, so that we can have these kinds of podcasts uh, and discuss uh, politics uh, in ways that maybe could not have been imagined uh, 10, 20 years ago. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, from from what you have shared about him, and uh, honestly, to hear you say that about him, uh, it really means something because, yeah, you you can be quite critical <laughs> in quite a lot of things, right? Yeah. So yeah, to yeah, hear yeah. you say this is quite like, oh wow. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, I've I've criticized <coughs> Kit Siang, you know, uh, in in the past in other arenas, uh, even recently, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, called out his uh, deafening silence for not saying anything about Najib's. Uh, you know, discount. Mm. Uh, but I think you know his record is uh, you know speaks for itself. Right. Uh, and I I think I'm quite fair in evaluating the contributions uh, of uh, yep. different politicians, and uh, definitely have to tabe respect uh, Lauta. That's what we call him. Mm. Uh, big big uh, the 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 big man, so to speak. Uh, the 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 sign of respect that we give to him by calling him Lauta. Uh, and uh, Lauta, I just want to take this opportunity to wish you uh, many happy returns, uh, happy birthday. 
uh, and also enjoy your retirement uh, from frontline politics, even though I know you continue to monitor the political uh, sphere with a very close uh, eye and very keen attention. Mm. Yeah. So I have to say that you have been someone who's very fair. Yeah. Also, you give credit to where it's due. Yeah. Uh, and from me, for me, when I hear what you say about him and piecing all the pictures together today, mm. uh, I would say that he made me realize that it is important to actually lead well. Yeah. Because ultimately, I think the biggest legacy that he has left behind from all of this is like what you say, you know, that 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 ability to actually give other people opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And you've always very often highlighted the fact that uh the party that you're in DAP is one of those that that really gives a lot of opportunity to the younger people. Yes. And we have always heard this uh this kind of uh, uh opportunities non existent in many other parties and we can see that as well. Mm. Yeah. Um uh, and I think that itself is a very powerful thing. And the fact that when Malaysia actually got its new government, hmm. he stepped down, right? Like yeah, he not, didn't take any position. Yeah, he yeah. didn't take any position. And he stepped down later, hmm. uh, retired from politics. Hmm. I think I already told you this before, even the last time when we had a chat, uh, when we first met not hmm. too long ago. I think one of the most important thing that a leader needs to know and and the, the the greatest hallmark of it is to know when to step down mm. and stepping down graciously and allow other people to take over the leadership and make the mistakes that they need to make. Mm. Stepping uh, down graciously, not not something that everyone can do, uh, including some current leaders in the DAP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the one I do not know. Huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> just a tease out there. Just a tease <laughs> out there. Yeah. But uh. Mm. Yeah, better than uh, some in his batch where other people are asking him to retire. Mm. <laughs> sure, sure. Yes. So, mm. yeah, I, I think that is something that he did very well in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, that, that's it. why, uh, you know, respect to him and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have a special place in my heart, Tan Sri Lim, and I uh, hope that you, you know, have, uh, you know, many, many years of uh, enjoying the company of your family. So, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for this episode. Yeah, hope you enjoy it. Please subscribe and like. We'll see you next week.